Um, the reason that I'm introducing Ian is that he should, if things had gone as expected when we booked him to do a talk, um, he should have been talking to Newton St. Sire's history group back in January. But as it is, um, he's with us today. Um, he's always been very, very interested in printing, books, and so on. And as many of you will know, he was West Country Studies Librarian until he retired about 15 years ago. Um, he's maintained his interest, and now he's got more time to devote to it. And um, you may also know that Exeter was awarded UNESCO um, City of Literature status, <clears throat> the only one, the only city in the UK to be awarded this in 2019. It's a four year programme and Ian has been contributing to that and now has quite a substantial website. Um, <clears throat> he also has been working on a, um, a Devon bibliography, which is a pretty major work. I think he said he'd got, uh, I've, 100,000 references that run from these old manuscripts. And then he said he might even take one to, from the Newton Wonder, which is the parish magazine of Newton St. Sires. Um, so a contrast, I think, <laughs> very big contrast. Anyway, um, Ian like to go ahead now, and thank you. Right, okay, I shall now um, start the pre-recorded um, talk and uh, I'll be available afterwards for questions and answers. So let's see if we can get it underway. This talk was previously given in 2018, together with an exhibition on the occasion of the unveiling by Exeter Civic Society of a blue plaque to Sir Thomas Bodley. It has been updated following Exeter's designation in 2019 as UNESCO City of Literature. The exhibition showed for the first time in more than four centuries images of 31 manuscripts now in Oxford but until 1602 in Exeter Cathedral Library. The often lengthy captions to the images are taken from the exhibition and the images are reproduced courtesy of the Bodleian Library. Sir Thomas Bodley, the cause of the removal of almost a hundred medieval manuscripts from Exeter to Oxford in 1602, comes from a good Devon stock, rooted in Dunscombe, in the parish of Crediton, just over the border from Newton St. Sires. In 1545 he was born at 229 High Street, Exeter, the son of a merchant and a fervent Protestant, John Bodley. In 1553, he fled with his father and Nicholas Hilliard to Geneva, returning in 1558 and settling in London, where in 1562 John Bodley received a patent to publish the Geneva Bible. In 1563 Thomas took the degree of BA at Oxford and in 1566 at Merton College the degree of MA, being elected University Proctor in 1569. In the late 1570s he travelled in Italy, France and Germany, and in 1580 was appointed Gentleman Usher to Queen Elizabeth. He became MP for Plymouth in 1584 and for St Germans in 1586. His first diplomatic mission to the Danish court was in 1585. He probably combined spying with diplomatic activities as his secret cipher indicates, but his activities did not always satisfy the Queen, who on at least one occasion wished he were dead. Fatigued by political intrigue, in 1597 he retired to Oxford to re revive the University Library, and in 1602 the Dean and Chapter of Exeter presented Bodley with the manuscripts from the Cathedral Library, with the intercession of his brother Lawrence, who was canon at the Cathedral, he died in Oxford in 1613. The Cathedral Library had grown over the years. In 1050, Bishop Leofric found only five volumes in the Minster when he moved the Cathedral from Crediton to Exeter. And, around 1070, 
he donated about 60 volumes to the cathedral. In 1327, an inventory listed 351 volumes. About 55 were service books, and 49 volumes received after the inventory was prepared, chiefly service books, were also listed. The actual total in the library was probably a little over 300 volumes. In 1506, another inventory listed 374 volumes in the library, 327 of them chained in 11 desks. A total of 634 volumes in the cathedral are listed, including many service books and some volumes of legal texts and other works stored in the old treasury and elsewhere. Some of these have probably been disposed of and replaced by printed texts before 1602 and others disappeared after the gift had been made. By 1752, only 18 medieval volumes remained in the cathedral library. The valuations quoted in the 1327 inventory were converted to present-day values by comparing today's national living wage with the 11 pence a week earned by labourers working in the quarries for the cathedral as recorded in the fabric rolls. This implies that one pound in 1327 was worth the equivalent of six thousand pounds today, but this should be regarded as an indicative figure only. There are about 97 volumes in the gift of, uh, to Bodley, of which 31 are represented in this talk. Almost half 41 volumes date from the early 12th century, a period when many volumes were commissioned from Normandy. The 14th century accounts for 20 volumes, and perhaps 10 date from Leofric's time. Of the 41 volumes of works by the Church Fathers, who lived from the 4th to 7th centuries, Augustine accounts for 17, Gregory for 12, Ambrose for 6, Isidore for 4, and Jerome for 2. Other early writers from the same period include Bede, Boethius, Johannes Cassianus and Prudentius. Later writers, mainly from the 13th century onward, account for 22 volumes, including Robert Holcott, Bartholomeus Anglicus, Robert Kilwardby, Jacobus Butter of Voragini, Thomas Aquinas and Bartholomew, Bishop of Exeter from 1160 to 1184. Liturgical and service books are represented by one Bible, one Gospel book, six glosses on the Bible, one penitential, six psalters and one missal. Law, medicine and astrology are among the non-theological subjects represented. We start with manuscripts that were in the library in Bishop Leofric's time. The Leofric Missal is made up of three manuscripts put together for Leofric. The Missal forms the main part and was probably written in Combray or Ara around 1040. Interspersed with this are an earlier English calendar in Latin, probably from Glastonbury about 970, and various sections written in several different hands, probably when Leofric was bishop in Exeter. These include masses, benedictions, exorcisms and historical matter. Fifteen manumissions granted in Exeter and Tavistock dating from 970 and 1050 written in Old English a list of sureties for land at Stoke Cannon, a Latin note on bishops, and a list of relics at Exeter, chiefly given by King Athelstan. The image shows part of the start of the section of the proper of time, a part of the missal, preceded by an initial D for Dominus. The script is a mixture of Carolingian minuscule for the main text, with uncials and Roman capitals for the headings. It also contains Leofric's curse against anyone who should remove the volume from the library. A gathering together between two boards, a variety of often unrelated texts, and its use to inscribe legal documents and other records, occur in other volumes in the Bodleian Gift. The Penitential of Egbert was written in Sherborne or Canterbury. This penitential handbook was composed around 740, possibly by Archbishop Egbert of York, 
and the image shows the start of the prologue of Egbert with an elaborate initial eye made up of interlaced grotesque creatures. Again, other items are added, such as an order of confession and part of a work believed to be the De Vita Sacerdotum of Haligarus, Bishop of Cambrai. The style of the writing and the capitals of this book closely remember, resembles that of the Sherborne Pontifical. Gregory's Penitential was written in France in the later 10th century in a Carolingian minuscule hand by a scribe named Johannes in the Colophon at the end of the manuscript. It also includes a number of works by Gregory and other writers. The image shows the listing of the 214 chapters of the penitential with the Roman numerals in red in the left-hand margin. There is a fragmentary old English inscription at the head of the page. Gregory the Great was Pope from 590 to 604. He is famous for instigating the first large-scale mission from Rome to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxons in England to Christianity. He is also well known for his many writings, and he is considered with Augustine, Jerome and Ambrose as one of the four great fathers of the Latin Church. Prudentius was a Roman Christian poet born in the Roman province of Tarraconensis in northern Spain in 348 AD. He probably died in the Iberian Peninsula around 413. This manuscript of his poems was written in England in the mid-11th century. The image illustrates the coloured capitals and copious notes and glosses to the poems. Some glosses are in Old English and all were probably written before the volume was presented by Leofric to Exegon. The hymn at the bottom of the second column has neumes, an early musical notation. There are also two Old English charms and another version of Leofric's curse, both in Latin and Old English, just to make sure. With Augustine's Contra Faustum Manicheum, we come to the first example of the Church Fathers that reached the library after Leofric's death. The volume has small illuminated capitals and two large capitals in pen and ink with interlacing bands, canine heads and other decoration. Like other volumes in the Bodley Gift, it was probably produced in a Norman scriptorium for Osborne, Bishop between 1072 and 1103, or William Borowast, Bishop from 1107 to 1137 who were both active in building up a collection of patristic texts. The image shows the end of the first book and the start of the second, with a large capital F drawn in pen and ink with interlacing bands. St Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, was one of the four great fathers of the early Latin Church. A theologian and philosopher from Numidia, his writings deeply influenced the development of Western Christianity and Western philosophy. According to his contemporary, Jerome, Augustine established anew the ancient faith. To many he is seen as the very human person who as a young man prayed, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. In the 1327 inventory, it's valued at 13 shillings perhaps £4,000 in today's money. This volume contains Augustine's commentary on Psalms 51 to 100. It is in the Norman style and was written at the start of the 12th century. Bishop Grandison's writing is on folio 1, including the words Ecclesia Exoniensis. The image shows the initial A which introduces Augustine's commentary on Psalm 91. Augustine remained the best represented writer in the library in 1506 when 31 volumes by him are listed. In 1327 it was valued at three shillings. 
900 pounds today. Augustine's commentary on St. John's Gospel is another work produced in a Norman monastery for Bishops Osborne or William Warrest around 1100. The image, image shows the incipit or here beginneth the medieval version of the title page. Another image from the same opening shows a decorated initial I representing the evangelist John holding his gospel and an oversized quill accompanied by various grotesque creatures. In 1327 it was valued at one mark, 13 and fourpence, perhaps £4,000 today. Augustine's City of God is probably the most influential of his works. This early 12th century Norman manuscript has several miniatures in capitals by at least two artists. A few of the 14th century annotations apply sentences in the treatise to events in England. The image shows the incubit at the base of the second column, preceded by the retractio of the author, St. Augustine, by way of a preface with the initial I made up of grotesque creatures. At the head of the page is an ownership in inscription, Liber Ecclesiae Exoniensis. In 1327 it was valued at one pound, perhaps six thousand pound today. Augustine's homilies on the Gospel of John is an English manuscript from the early 12th century and contains ten sermons on charity with a prologue based on John's Gospel. The image shows the incubate which details the contents of the volume with an elaborate initial letter M for Meminit. The initial was written after the text, which it partially obscures. In 1327 it was valued at two shillings, perhaps £600 today. Gregory's registers are here represented in a Norman manuscript of the early 12th century. There are notes in the volume in Bishop Grandison's hand. The image shows the opening page with a deco decorated initial C for credo, introducing Gregory's statement of faith or creed as a prologue to the re re register of letters in 14 books, which is introduced by a decorated initial U. Gregory was a prolific letter writer and copies of some 854 letters have survived. During Gregory's time, copies of papal letters were made by scribes into a registrum, a register, which was then kept in a screenum or bookcase. In the 9th century, the registrum of Gregory's letters was formed of 14 papyrus rolls. The original rolls are now lost, the 854 letters surviving in copies made at various later times. Most of the letters date from the last 15 years of his life when he was Pope, between 590, 590 and 604. The 14 rolls are reflected in the 14 books of the present volume. In 1327 it was valued at 10 shillings, perhaps £3,000 today. Gregory's Moralia is based on the book of Job and is seen here in a 12th century English manuscript. It is one of the longest patristic works written between 578 and 595, begun when Gregory was at the court of Tiberius II at Constantinople, but finished only after he had already been in Rome for several years, possibly as early as 591. It is Gregory's major work filling some 35 books or six volumes. The present volume contains books 1 to 16. The image shows an initial R at the start of one of the books, added by a later illuminator, partially obscuring the text. It is valued at the unusually high price of £4, perhaps £24,000 today. This copy of Gregory's homilies on Ezekiel 
was probably produced in a Norman, Norman scriptorium for Exeter Cathedral in the late 11th century. This image is of the opening page, showing an illuminated initial D decorated with interlacing tendrils and a grotesque animal. There is an ownership inscription of the 14th century, Iste est liber ecclesiae cathedralis exoniae. In 1327, it was valued at three shillings, perhaps 900 pounds today. Gregory's Liber Pastoralis is another Norman manuscript produced in Normandy for Exeter in the late 11th century. The image shows the incipit of the first part of the work with an elaborate initial showing Gregory writing the text of the book. The second book follows at folio 44 and a list of chapters precedes the work. The 1327 inventory lists three sets of Gregory's Libra Pastoralis ranging in value from two to five shillings, £600 to £1,500 today. Jerome, who lived from 347 to 420, was one of the four great fathers of the Latin Church. His works are represented by 11 volumes in the 1327 inventory, as against 9 for Ambrose, 14 for Gregory and 25 for Augustine. The present volume, a 12th century English manuscript, contains eight works on the Old Testament by Jerome and two not by him. It is described in the inventories of 1327 and 1506 by the first work in the volume, De Distantis Locorum. The image shows the end of the section on the distance of, distances of places and the start of the section on the interpretation of Hebrew names, preceded by an elaborate P in red and blue. In 1327 it was valued at 10 shillings, perhaps 3,000 3, pounds today. Jerome's treatise on Isaiah, another Norman product for Exeter, made in around 1100, contains the whole treatise in 18 books with a prologue. It also contains an ownership inscription of the 14th century, Liber Ecclesiae Exoniensis de Communibus. The image shows the incipit with an elaborate initial V showing Christ enthroned with Isaiah exhorting the people to turn to him. There is a smaller initial P at the start of the prologue. In 1327, it was valued at one mark, 13 and fourpence, perhaps £4,000 today. The second image from Jerome's work on Isaiah shows the colophon. Explicit liber beati hieronymi super Isaiam. Above it is Imago Pictoris et Illuminatoris Huius Operis, a miniature of the Illuminator at work, Hugo Pictor by name, with pen in hand and inkhorn by his side. This volume of Jerome's Commentaries on the Bible was written probably in France in the early 12th century. The image shows the listing of the contents of the book. Comparison with the actual contents shows it to be somewhat confused. It contains ten works by or attributed to St. Jerome, chiefly commentaries on books of the Bible, including some also present in the Old Testament collection already seen. The Five Treatises of Ambrose on Virginity is another manuscript which may have been produced in a Norman scriptorium for Osborne or William Waddlerast around 1100. The image is a close-up of the initial letter in blue and red on folio 56, which introduces Ambrose's De Virginibus. It also enables us to admire the beautifully formed Carolingian minuscule of the text. A high price was not placed on virginity in 1327 when the book was valued at only two shillings, perhaps £600 today. A 
Ambrose, who lived from 340 to 397, is the fourth and last of the great church fathers to be shown here. His De Fide, three treatises on faith in nine books, is represented by another manuscript probably produced in a Norman scriptorium for Osborne or William Borwas around 1100. The image shows an elaborate initial R in red ink with interlacings and a grotesque creature. The start of the text, Regina Austri Venit Audire Sepientiam Salomonis, refers to the visit of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon. In 1327, it was valued at four shillings, perhaps twelve hundred pounds today. The title of this volume of Ambrose, Apologia Pro, Pro David, is taken from the first item in the volume. The images of the opening page with a list of the six works in the volume and the start of the Apologia Pro David in Expositione Psalmi. It is yet another manuscript which may have been produced in the Norman scriptorium for Osborne or Warrell Rast. In 1327, it was valued at three shillings, perhaps nine hundred pounds today. This volume of the Opuscula, the lesser works of Pseudo Athanasius, was written probably in Normandy at the end of the 11th century. It contains eight theological works, chiefly by Vigilius Tapsensis. Bishop of Thapsus at the end of the 5th century, writing under the name of Saint Athanasius. The image of folio 23 shows the end of the 6th book on the Trinity and the start of the 7th with a fine illuminated initial P with interlacings and human and animal figures. In 1327 it was valued at 5 shillings, perhaps £1,500 today. This manuscript of St. Paul's Epistles contains the marginal gloss of Wallafried Strabo and the interlinear gloss of Anselm of Leon. The text of the Epistles is given in a larger minuscule hand. It is a later 12th century English manuscript and the image shows the opening page with the largest illuminated capital in the volume with scenes from the life of St. Paul and in red the incipit of the first epistle to the Romans. In the 1327 inventory, it is valued at three shillings, perhaps £900 today. The second image from St Paul's Epistles shows um, folio one, 125, the start of the Epistle to the Hebrews, the incipit being highlighted in red. This volume of glosses on the Gospels of John and Mark is an English manuscript written in the late 12th and early 13th centuries. The image shows the front elevation of the Temple of, of Jerusalem as seen in the vision of Ezekiel. The work by Richard of St Victor is not the main part of the volume which contains glosses on the Gospels of John and Mark as well as the Epistles to the Hebrews. It was originally separate from the glosses and is earlier than them in date. In 1327 it was valued at 20 shillings, perhaps £6,000 today. This volume contains the Psalms with the gloss of Peter Lombard and is an 8th 12th century English manuscript. The image of folio 241 shows the whole page with two illuminated initials. Both initials are part of the marginal gloss by Peter Lombard, which makes up the bulk of the page, the text of the psalm itself being a mere eight lines in a larger minuscule hand. Peter Lombard, who lived from about 1096 to 1160, was born in Navarra, a scholastic theologian, Bishop of Paris, where he died, and author of four books of sentences, which became a standard textbook of theology, for which he earned the accolade 
Magister Sententiarum. The ownership inscription in a 13th century hand threatens anyone who removes the book with eternal malediction. In this early 13th century volume, the commentary of Peter Lombard accompanies the text of the Epistles of St Paul in Latin in smaller writing in a parallel column, while an outer column gives the fathers from whom Peter Lombard largely derived his notes. The image shows the incubit with an illuminated P, with a grotesque creature with a human head. It bears the own ownership inscription, Liber Ecclesiae Cathedralis Exonie, in a 14th century hand. Nicholas Trivet was an Anglo-Norman chronicler born in Somerset about 1258. His commentary on the Psalms was probably copied during his lifetime during the early 14th century. This West Country lad travelled widely. He became a Dominican friar in London and studied first at Oxford and later in Paris. He was prior of his order in London, taught at Oxford and was at Santa Maria Novella in Florence. He wrote a large number of theological and historical works and commentaries on the classics, especially Seneca. He is chiefly remembered by his chronicle of the Angevin kings of England, an important source for the period between 1135 and 1307. The image of folio 250 includes three miniatures of musicians, one playing the bagpipes, the second an organ and the third striking bells. The red text or rubric forms the explicit or colophon marking the end of the main text. This book was given to the cathedral by Bishop Grandison. This image shows a typical opening of Trivet's book, folios 60 verso and 61 recto, demonstrating the layout in two columns with illuminated initials and a lively marginal figure. The decorative initial B introduces the gloss on Psalm 41. The script particularly the larger, ver larger version used for the heading, is in the angular textura style developed during the Gothic period. This 12th century volume of the Canons of the Church covers a period prior to Gratian and the de Decrifles. It includes collections of canons decreed by various early councils in Greece, Africa, France and Spain up to the 7th century. The Catholic Church has the oldest continuous functional legal system in the West. What began with the rules or canons adopted by the Apostles at the Council of Jerusalem in the 1st century developed into a highly complex legal system encapsulating not just norms of the New Testament, but some elements of the Hebrew, Roman, Visigothic, Saxon and Celtic legal traditions. As many as 36 collections of canon law are known to have been compiled before 1150. This volume was owned in 1414 by Canon Walter Gibbs, who gave it to the cathedral. The image shows the opening page with the incipit in red and initial letters in blue and red. The script is a Carolingian minuscule. In 1327, a volume of canon law was valued at two pounds, perhaps 12,000 pound today. Saint Is Isidore of Seville, who lived between about 560 and 636, was Archbishop of Seville and is widely regarded as the last of the fathers of the church and has been termed the last scholar of the ancient world. The volume contains the complete encyclopedic treatise known as his etymologies with four letters from Isidore to Braulio and two from Braulio as a preface. Two preliminary leaves contain sections R to Z of a 15th century index of subjects. The etymologiae is an etymological encyclopedia which assembled extracts of many books from classic of antiquity that would have otherwise been lost. He was the first Christian writer to try to compile a summa of universal knowledge. 
This first Christian encyclopedia is a huge compilation of 448 chapters in 20 volumes. It was printed as early as 1472. Later encyclopedias, such as the Catholicon and De Proprietatibus Rerum, derive much of their material from Isidore. The image shows the end of a section on mathematics and the start of a section on music, indicated by the line in red in the first column, followed by a list of the subsections. It may have been produced in the Norman scriptorium around 1100 for Osborne or William Warrest in Exeter, and in 1327 is valued at four shillings, perhaps £1,200 in today's prices. Thomas Aquinas was canonised in 1324, and this copy of his Catena Aurea, or Golden Chain, on Matthew and Mark was probably made about this time. It contains annotations of Bishop Grandison. The image shows part of chapter 13 of Mark's Gospel. The text of the Gospel is in larger, widely spaced script, with the gloss by St Thomas Aquinas to the left. St Thomas Aquinas, who lived from 1225 to 1274, was an Italian Dominican friar, Catholic priest and doctor of the Church. He was an immensely influential philosopher, theologian and jurist in the tradition of the scholasticism, within, within which he is known as the Doctor Angelicus and the Doctor Communis. The Catena Aurea is a compilation of the thoughts of the Church Fathers on the four Gospels. The cathedral possessed both volumes of the Catena Aurea, which are given in 1327 the high value of four marks, two pound thirteen and fourpence, sixteen thousand pound in today's prices. The final two volumes are added are works added after the 1327 inventory was compiled. The encyclopedic work of Bartholomeus Anglicus, De Proprietatibus Rerum, was copied in the 1370s. The image shows the ownership inscription. This book is the gift of Master Robert Rigg, Chancellor of this church, to be chained in perpetuity in the common library of the said church. Robert Rigg, Chancellor of Exeter, was previously Chancellor of the University of Oxford between 1381 and 1391, and he died sometime before January the 22nd, 1411, when his executor delivered this and another vol for book to the chapter of Exeter. De Proprietatibus Rerum, On the Nature of Things, is the most widely copied, adapted and translated medieval encyclopaedia. It encompasses theology and astrology as well as the natural sciences. It was written around 1240 at the School of Magdeburg in Saxony and intended for the use of students and the general public. It's structured on astro astrological principles, divided into 19 books, a number arising from the sum of the 12 signs of the zodiac and the seven planets signifying universality. The author Bartholomeus Anglicus, who lived from about 1203 to 1272, lectured in divinity at the University of Paris and became a Franciscan about 1225. This French 15th century manuscript of Somnium Viridarii contains a fundamental text of the late Middle Ages. Written in Latin and translated into French, it is a legal work, written between 1376 and 1378, generally attributed to Évrard de Tromercon, councillor to King Charles V and later Bishop of Dol de Bretagne. The author falls asleep in a meadow and in a dream sees the king, accompanied by the Pope, then a clerk and finally a knight, chosen as advocates to debate points of law on the relationship between spiritual and temporal power. 
The image of the opening page shows the author asleep in a garden, with the figures representing temporal and spiritual power which figure in his dream. Placed at the top of the page above the incubate, which is written in red, it is the first of three miniatures in the book, which are fine examples of the international Gothic style, which was in full flower in France and Burgundy in the 15th century. Before we move on to the final section, a consideration of how this medieval library might be recreated, let us look at the spirit in which so many of these manuscripts were copied. A 12th century sermon added to Durham Cathedral manuscript contains this revealing insight both into the minds of many of the copyists and of the methods of manuscript production. It takes each item used in the process of making a manuscript and tells of its spiritual significance. The work of the scribes had filled the space available in the cathedral by 1412, and the cathedral authorities decided to accommodate the manuscripts in the north walk of the cloisters against the south wall of the cathedral. In 1411, the project to fit out the library was begun. Two carpenters were employed, Hammond Jackal received two and sixpence a week and his assistant, Henry Atwater, two shillings and one penny a week. Detailed accounts for the work survive in Dean and Chapter Manuscript 2669, the general account of Richard Skinner from the 30th of September 1411 to the 29th of September 1412, show his receipts. Eighteen pounds, six shillings and sevenpence halfpenny from the estate of John Lindwood. Sixteen pounds, seven shillings and ninepence from the steward of chancery. A total of thirty-five pound, four shillings and fourpence halfpenny. The expenses for materials amounted to seven pounds, fourteen shillings and eightpence, including for 73 shelving boards, five boards for desks and seats, and 350 board nails. Also, drink given, given to the carpenters by the steward's order, a meal mere eightpence. The wages of the carpenters for 40 weeks from July 1412 to April 1413 came to nine pounds, three shillings and sixpence. Expenses incurred in binding books and other matters, including some work undertaken at Ashburton, came to eighteen pounds, five shillings and five pence halfpenny. Some evidence can be drawn from the accounts list. For furniture, 73 shelving boards, 5 boards for seats, 350 nails and 12 iron bars is sufficient for up to 12 desks, each made up of 6 to 8 boards fixed with 24 to 32 nails. For books, 253 calf skins, sheep skins and red skins, 121 sheets for guards, and probably end papers, 163 books were stitched and 194 chains were provided. This is sufficient to rebind and provide with chains up to 194 volumes, 16 per desk. There were perhaps 150 volumes already bound and provided with chains. These calculations show that based on the wages of the two carpenters, one pound in 1412 is equivalent to 4,000 pounds in 2020. The total income for fitting out the library in 1412 was 35 pounds, four shillings and fourpence halfpenny. The total expenses for fitting out the library were 35 pounds, 13 shillings and sevenpence halfpenny. So Richard Skinner almost kept his budget. 
The equivalent budget for a library project like this in 2020 would be around £142,000 and the overrun less than £2,000. Modern planners of large projects have much to learn from the medieval cathedral authorities. A brief look again at the growth of Exeter Library between 1070 and 1506 from the 65 volumes in 1070 which were given by Leofric through 100, 324 volumes in the library in 1327 in 1412, at 194 volumes were bound and provided with chains, and in 1506, there were 374 volumes in the library, chained to 11 desks. There are a few printed items in 1506. One notable exception is five volumes of Ab Abbas on the Decretals, probably printed in Venice by Johannes de Colonia and Johannes Manton between 1475 and 1480. The manuscripts of Exeter's gift to Bodley were moved into Duke Humphrey's library, newly provided with desks by Thomas Bodley. Their appearance can be examined more closely in Hereford Cathedral's Chained Library, established in 1611 by Thomas Thornton, Canon of Hereford. The library they moved from was very different, lacking the shelves above the reading desk. Two such libraries survive in Europe. Zutphen Library was built in 1564 as part of the Church of St. Walburga. Sixty keys to the front door of the library were issued, not only to the canons, but also to selected townspeople. The Malatastina Library in Chesena was purpose-built from 1447 to 1452 and opened in 1454. It was named after the local aristocrat Malatesta Novello and was perhaps the first civic library in Europe belonging to the commune rather than the church or a noble family and open to the general public. Unlike Zutphen Library, this had shelves below the desk to hold additional volumes. Based on the provision of six to eight boards, one iron bar and 24 to 32 nails per desk mentioned in the accounts and the requirement for shelves below the inclined reading desk to accommodate the number of volumes assigned to each desk in 1506, which ranged from 14 to 49 in the inventory. This hypothetical design for a cathedral library desk can be drawn up. These desks can be fitted neatly into the 1412 library in the north walk of the cloister, since demolished, but now with a project for rebuilding. Richard Parker's reconstructed drawing includes a cutaway to show the library complete with readers. It would be satisfying to see the reconstruction of at least one desk in situ with some sort of virtual re reconstruction of the entire library as it was in 1506. Perhaps this could be a project during Exeter's term as UNESCO City of Literature. This talk is one of a series produced during lockdown 2020 to celebrate the designation of Exeter as UNESCO City of Literature in 2019. Thank you for listening. I do find some of this stuff fascinating when you when you consider that the, these um, these volumes um, are um, produced at a time um, where um, the church is is very pious. I do I do very much like the fact that you find all these monstrous creatures within the um, within the illuminations, and um, you've you've got charms and and folk remedies in there. Uh, I'm, I'm quite taken with the fact that we could replace our library fine system with one of eternal malediction, which I think might be quite good. I might put in um, put in a request so that we, that we have eternal malediction on our scale of library fines in the future. I quite like that.
It wouldn't work because none of the books that have this curse attached to them are where they were originally now, are they? They've all gone away. So the curse was quite ineffective. <laughs> I suspect the budget on chains would be quite high nowadays as well, to be honest. Um, if anybody would like to ask Ian any questions based on the presentation that you have just watched and listened to, then, um, then do pop them into the chat or, or just... Um, click the little button at the bottom of your Zoom that says raise hand and I'll know that you've got a question. Um, there's just something in the chat there from Sue who says, not not Sue Library Sue, Sue Small um, says, I'm in Denver, Colorado and just recently discovered my 10 times great grandfather was born in Devon about 1598 to 1600. So Thomas Bodley removed these illuminated manuscripts in 1602 when my 10 times great grandmother, uh, grandfather was a toddler. It's amazing to think about the time frame of that. Definitely yes. is. That's fascinating. Mm, maybe, maybe they met. Who knows? Uh, Isabel, how many of the books from this period are still in Exeter Cathedral Library? Probably a about half a dozen, I would think. Um, Could be under the and strangely enough, um, the two in most famous ones, uh, the Exxon Doomsday isn't mentioned because it's not a library book, it's, a, it's an archive. Um, and the distinction was made even at that early time. Um, the Exeter Book of Anglo-Saxon Poetry, which is, a, which is the main one, um, was never listed. Um, there, there are, um, sections in the inventories which say something like um, 30 books which were not considered of any value so were not were not listed and then um, you know, 30 other books that are worn out by age and antiquity um, so the Exeter book must already have been uh, one of those um, and so it never never got into the the listings Thank you. Uh, another question from the chat, uh, and then I'll come to David uh, for his question. First of all, from the chat, are these manuscripts scanned and available to be viewed by the public online? Well, you've got your hand up. Uh, a lot of them are. Um, I originally got hold of these uh, many years ago uh, when I first arrived at, uh, in the West Country Studies Library. I got them as uh, film strips produced by the Bodleian. And it's mainly the contents of those film strips um, that have got on to the Bodleian digital website. Um, if you go into the uh, digital Bodleian, I think it's called, I, I, I can't, don't know now. Um, and uh, they've got a massive uh, amount of material that has been digitized. <clears throat> Not a great deal um, of uh, the illuminated manuscripts that came from the uh, Cathedral Library. Um, I probably covered most of those that have been, um, but some of those have had um, the whole pages or many, many of the pages um, digitized, um, but there's still a lot to be done there. And <laughs> maybe um, the uh, UNESCO City of Literature will get some funding to uh, perhaps digitize some of them and bring them back to Exeter, repatriate them. Be nice, wouldn't it? I've just dropped into the chat for anybody who wants to grab it by copy and paste um, the set of links that Ian has provided for, for his various um, websites and other bits and pieces that you might find of interest. So do, um, do grab those uh, if those are useful to you. That's the ones that were on the last slide of the presentation. Uh, David, Nation has a question, so we will go to you next, David, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. I was intrigued by the monetary values that you referred to <laughs> right the way through, Ian. I wondered how they were computed. Were, were they the cost of employing scribes to produce the work in the first place, or was there a sort of, uh, I don't know, a second-hand value or something? Yeah. attached to the uh, manuscripts? It's difficult to say. Um, and of course, they're all very rough and ready. A medieval book was very different from a um, printed book. I mean, for a start, it was on vellum um, and it's extremely expensive 
and tedious to produce venom. Each of those books required the slaughter of flocks of sheep or herds of cattle um, to produce the, the vellum on which the books were written and in which the leather they were bound with. Um, scribes uh, would be doing it for the love of God in theory. Um, uh, so uh, it was only later on that you began to get stationers in uh, universities um, who began to turn out books um, uh, for students in sections and they'd be hired out um, for a sum of money um, and that really began in about the 12th 13th century I suppose with the, with the growth of the universities so the putting a value on these things is, is really extremely tenuous. Um, I based it on the rates of wages of the carpenters rather than the scribes um, and uh, multiplied that out and used that as a basis. Um, but I mean, there's so many variables, the way of life was so different um, in those days, it's, it's difficult to, you know, to compare. Um, and also you don't know what um, perks they got in the way of uh, the cost of being accommodated and, um, and so on. You know, the two and sixpence a week that, uh, that they were earning is, uh, what did it give? What, 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 was there anything else that went with it? So it's very rough and ready. And the other thing, of course, is, is that um, there was, isn't the antiquarian value um, given to, to, to these items. Um, one of some of the most valuable ones are more recently produced manuscripts um, at that time, where the, presumably there was a cost that had been involved fairly recently in acquiring them. Um, and uh, that gives you some indication of the cost of, of producing. But if one of those came on the market now, um, you would be talking more than £6,000, I would have thought, if it came up at auction. So right. the question of money is, uh, is, is very difficult. To... Quick supplementary, if I may, then. Where would the scribes have, have, have lived? I mean, were they monks in monasteries or what? Yes, um, the scriptoria were normally based in, in monasteries. Um, it was part of the income generation in a way. Um, they would uh, um, have uh, books that were commissioned by the cathedral. It would be nice to think that Hugo Pictor, who, the, who was the little scribe that was depicted there, actually came over to, to, to Exeter to produce some of these items, but it, uh, I, I doubt it. Um, uh, and uh, it would be mainly in, in monasteries rather than cathedrals, although there may well have been a, a scriptorium in Exeter. It's a whole fraught question of, of where was the Exeter uh, Book of Anglo-Saxon verse produced? And everybody would like to think that it was produced in Exeter, but um, it was probably produced in, in Crediton when the cathedral was there. Um, and there were scribes usually attached to the administrative work of the cathedral um, as well. Um, and they would also turn their hand to producing uh, manuscripts as well. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, David. Uh, just popping back to the chat briefly before we go to the next one from the, uh, from the Zoom room. Uh, just following on from, from Isabel's previous question um, about which books are still found in the cathedral library, uh, Isabel then went on to say, um, does, does it mean that the religious books are the ones which were more highly valued? Um, well, in 1602, I don't think any of them were valued. Um, the, the, uh, manuscripts were old hat then. Um, they've been replaced by printed books, which in theory were much more accurate. Um, and... Uh, people weren't interested in, in illuminated manuscripts, except for um, the Bodleian Library, Sir Thomas Bodley, and also um, Thomas James, the librarian, 
And I think that uh, there's a lot of correspondence between Bobley and, and James, which is very fascinating to read. Um, and uh, <coughs> he uh, was very keen, they were both Protestant scholars, very fervent Protestants. And James um, had uh, this theory that um, the scribes had changed the works of the church fathers um, and uh, adulterated their content um, uh, you know, to further the, the Catholic uh, church's uh, position. Um, and so he was very keen to come across these works of the church fathers way back several hundred years old at that time, quite early versions of the, um, the, 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 the church fathers. And so that's why they, they are, um, you know, dominant uh, component of the hundred or so manuscripts um, that went up from uh, Exeter um, to, to Oxford to further his researches. Does that answer your question? Not quite. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions to come to that I can see. Uh, just before we do, uh, I'm just going to give an obligatory reminder that at the end of the Q&A, I will let people know what's coming up next month. To, so do stick around for that. And also to fulfill my charitable obligations, I am posting a link in the chat. Uh, to the Libraries Unlimited website. We, uh, Libraries Unlimited do work with the credit and area history groups to produce these um, monthly presentations free of charge for everybody. Uh, if you would like to give a small donation to help the library uh, do its thing, then there is a link in the chat where you can do so and we will be very grateful. Thank you very much, but do not feel obliged. Uh, next question is in the room from Tony Gale, who has a hand up. Tony, what's your question, please? Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Ian. That was, I, I really enjoyed that. One of the latter books that you mentioned in there, which was the one you described as an encyclopedia, of course, something like On the Nature of Things, uh, introduced quite a lot of material from other cultures, other religions, if you like. So there was, uh, there was some stuff from the ancient world and from the Arabic world. Uh, and I think, if I, th I think that was something around the 14th century, which seemed to be quite early to be uh, to be importing that kind of learning. It made me wonder if we know anything about the readership for the, for the library. Was it exclusively people within the church, or did it invite others in? Have, have we any knowledge of that at all? Um, we don't have a register of borrowers or anything like that, although they do survive for a later, later period for the, um, uh, the cathedral library, um, much, very much post-printing, of course. Um, books would be let out occasionally. They needed to be let out quite often for, for cop copying, further copying. Um, uh, and they were received by donation as well from, ver from various people, bishops and uh, canons and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, but as far as readership is concerned, um, presumably um, clerics will be able to be let in to read them because they're all safely chained up. Um, uh, but uh, books were quite often lent, lent out um, and they could be away for years um, because it takes you know, a long time to, to copy. Um, but of course literacy wasn't uh, that widespread at the time and there was um, an awful lot which is not represented in the library. Um, it wouldn't be, uh, there's very little literature apart from the poetry of the Exeter book, um, for example. There is a certain amount of uh, medical uh, literature, um, including material from the Arab world. Um, so, you know, possibly medical practitioners would be allowed in to have a look at that. Um, but uh, I think it was really for a fairly closed circle of the well, quite considerable um, number of people who were attacked attached to the, the, the dean and chapter and the running of the cathedral and uh, presumably the clergy 
um, when they were able to get in, um, would be able to consult the, uh, the books in the library. But I don't think it's buzzing like it's in the central library today. <laughs> I don't imagine so. Incidentally, thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on rechristening the Exeter book as the Credison book. We'll go. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Uh, the last question that I'm aware of, unless anybody else makes a question known to me in the meantime, is Jean. Um, well, thank you. Mine has been, well, I have two questions, but the first has been largely answered. I was going to ask about the politics of the removal of these documents. So does Ian think that they were really removed for safekeeping or to save them from misuse or being used as a, a political um, aid at the time? Um, well, one reason that they did arrive from Exeter um, to uh, Oxford was that um, Thomas Bodley's brother just happened to be a canon at Exeter Cathedral. So no doubt he put in a good word and thought that it would be a good thing. I also think that it was a way of clearing out dead stock, basically. Um, <laughs> and it has to be said that if, if you look closely at the catalogue entries, um, the Bodleian, they have all been, a large number of them have re been rebound in standard bindings. It doesn't look as if they have been particularly well looked after. Um, and some of the ones that I've shown actually are, are quite badly damaged, uh, particularly either ends, the front and back, um, which are a little bit more vulnerable to, uh, uh, to damage. So um, I, I, think, I think the reason was really um, clearing out room, you know, <laughs> <laughs> make room for some, room for some printed books. And my second question was, um, is there any, any writings of Boniface in the Exeter Cathedral Library or are all those, I believe there are um, letters and so on that Boniface sent, but are there all, all those in Germany? Yes, um, in Germany, uh, I think there is a, a um, wonderful collection of his letters which is in, in uh, a library in um, Fulda, it might not be Fulda, I can't remember now, um, it's an early manuscript volume which contains um, most of the um, letters of Boniface. Um, I managed, I, I put a posting recently on um, the Devon and Cornwall Record Societies um, page of, about a, a letter from um, Leoba, um, who was uh, writing to Boniface as a, as a kins, kinswoman, um, introducing herself. Um, they're very vivid, very interesting, the, the letters of Boniface. They didn't get into print until the 1620s, I think. Um, uh, but they, they have been printed and, and published more recently than that and translated as well. Um, but as far as I know, there were none in the Cathedral Library. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you for a, a very interesting talk. And um, I forgot to say earlier on when I introduced you about um, your, your run you're going to do, Eight Miles for Hospice Care. It's not a um, run, it's a walk. I'm <laughs> not up to running. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not so much of a it's run. A <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a brisk walk. A uh, brisk walk. I, do, I know you walk quickly. <laughs> raise funds for, funds for hospice care. I think there is a link that's, uh, if you want to... I've, want posted, to I've posted a link in yeah, the chat. No obligation, of course, and uh, you can... Uh, and sponsor me anonymously. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> he will spend all his time studying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, just just uh, worth noting as a side note that obviously uh, that we do keep the um, St Boniface collection 
in reference in credit and library, which, which does include um, a lot of relatively old and obscure print versions of books, including, if I remember correctly, the Letters of St Boniface. We do have a copy of the print version of um, St Boniface's Letters as part of that collection. Um, obviously uh, difficult to access for the public at the moment, um, but I am working on um, a catalogue which will be accessible online so that people can see everything that is in that collection as a first instance and then we can go from there. Um, so I will make more information about that available as and when that is done. Uh, in a moment I will tell you what's coming up next month but in the meantime do please whilst I stop recording all show your appreciation in whichever way you choose to do so for Ian's talk. Thank you. <laughs> 